please will you stand? Well, a very warm welcome to St. Andrew's Church as we gather to celebrate the life of our dear brother, David Pitches. My name's Tim Horlock. I'm the vicar here, and it's my privilege to welcome you, especially for those who are participating on the live stream as well. Before I open with a prayer, just a, a few notices. The family would like to invite you all to have tea here uh, at St. Andrew's Church following uh, this service. Um, so do please stay if you can. And if you would like to give a gift in memory of David, the details are on the back of your service sheet. The family have chosen two charities close to David's heart, New Hope and the Peace Hospice. Also, there are copies of David's joke book for sale on the back, <laughs> <laughs> rather aptly named Burying the Bishop. <laughs> We remain standing as we pray. Risen Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the life of your servant David Pitches. We praise you for the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life to those who believe in you. Come, Holy Spirit. And fill us with the joy of this hope. And pour out your love upon us now as we worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I now hand over to Bishop Christopher, who will be leading our service today. Th thank you, Tim. Tim, it's very moving to see you standing here as one of David's successors. Um, in this church which he loved so much and served uh, faithfully with Mary for 19 years, Mary, and then um, remained uh, devoted to. Well, I, I'm Christopher, David's son-in-law, and uh, I was given instructions uh, about, uh, well, quite a few years ago uh, by David for uh, this service. Uh, and that's pretty much what we're doing. We're, we're, we're following the... Uh, <laughs> The order, the, the, the plans that David uh, laid out, uh, we just made a few adaptations, mainly to um, uh, take note of uh, further generations who've arrived uh, in the family. And uh, um, much to David's desire and Mary's, we have, I think, all the generations, pretty much, not the tiniest one. Uh, but although, actually, no, we do have them all represented, and, and most will be taking part. Um, Tim, uh, your bishop, Bishop um, Allen, uh, I know wanted to be here. He tried to um, manoeuvre his diary, but just wasn't able to do it. But he, he has asked me to convey these words. David exercised a distinguished ministry for nearly 70 years, both in this country and overseas. He will be remembered for his long and fruitful service here in the diocese at St. Andrews, over the years, many people have been deeply blessed by David's pastoral teaching and prophetic ministry, and I, along with them, thank God for him. 
Our prayers are with Mary and the family as they release David back into the everlasting arms. Well, we have been doing that over these past days, releasing David into those everlasting arms. And we did that formally in the sun uh, at uh, the cemetery, the, Lord Sem- the Lawn Cemetery here, uh, in, in the presence of, of the Lord, the Son of God. And, uh, well, we're now here gathered to give thanks for this wonderful man who, who touched our lives in so many um, wonderful ways. Um, he wanted us to begin with these words from the Lord. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And Jesus also said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms, the great words from the book of Deuteronomy, and more from the Old Testament, which we rely on for ourselves and have faith in for David. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. They are new every morning. So rise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. We're going to give God glory and enjoy God's being in the presence of God's glory. Conscious that David is in closer sight of the glory of God. Uh, Phil, Hannah, you're going to lead us with, with the band. If you feel you need to sit at any point, uh, please, please do. Phil, Hannah. You're the faithful one.
Dear friends, as we were singing to the Lord, maybe like me, you were aware that those songs were like a commentary on David's life. They were also a a commentary on the last few days of his life. And Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus became a sort of anthem that he asked to be sung to him. Uh, And we could see that his eyes were firmly fixed on Jesus, and that's what he would want us to do today. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, band. Please would you sit. And now Nina, Nina Barrett, granddaughter, is going to come and read uh, um, from David's autobiography. David was a very good proofreader, actually. Uh, you know, I was, we would send him writing and he would check it and scrawl all over it. Um, uh, he, he wasn't in a fit state to notice that, I, that I'd made a mistake with his biography. It's actually living at the edge, not living on the edge. Uh, Nina, thank you. Growing up, I was fortunate to have Peter to come with me as we ventured into the great outdoors. I assume now that Peter, like me, was making the same numinous connections and somehow computing the little mysteries of life around us. All of nature speaks of God, though I don't think we ever discussed it in anything like religious terms. We took it all for granted as we tramped the fields watching nature grazing, chasing, fighting, mating, and dying. Death was not reserved for the animal world either. We knew the whole community and we knew the people who died there. My father was usually one of the first to know. Certainly, our village gravedigger seemed busy enough. In the midst of life, we are in death. But we children could come to terms with that. It was happening all the time. We had a symbiotic relationship with nature. Death was as normal as life in our world and could, like the kestrel in the sky, be down on you before you knew it. Your life, it is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away, said James. This did not make us feel depressed or morbid It simply taught us about the cycle of nature, that earthly life had its limits. It was from the Bible that we learnt of its real solemnity. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. I think that nature and scripture mingle well in the soul of a child. 
Nature showed us that life could be orderly yet messy, peaceful yet aggressive, ominously mysterious yet overpoweringly beautiful, chaotic yet purposeful. Understand creative things if you want to know the creator. Thank you, Nina. Thank you. Uh, I wasn't aware that was the reading. That's extraordinary, isn't it? That's, he embodied that in his whole ministry. Peter, dear Peter, David's brother, is uh, here today with his dear wife, Beryl. Uh, Tim is going to uh, give a family tribute. Tim, where are you? Is he still here? Tim, yeah. <laughs> My grandpa was the ninth child of a Tom and Irene Pitches. His father was rector of first Gislingham, where grandpa was born, and then Holbrook in Suffolk. As we've just heard from Nina, grandpa often recounted many stories of fond memories of his childhood growing up in rural Suffolk. Suffolk. He had a close relationship with the natural world and a great affection for his siblings. From an early age, Grandpa wanted to go into the ministry. So after school at Framingham College, he went on to Tyndall Hall, now part of Trinity College, Bristol. His first curacy was at St Ebb's Oxford, where he met Nanan, who was secretary of the Young People's Fellowship. They got married in 1958, and later that, that year, they moved to St Patrick's, Wallington, where my, where my mother, Charlotte, was born. Both Grandpa and Nanan said they felt God's call to the mission field and went to Wallington on the condition that if the door opened, they could go to Chile. So, lo and behold, in 1959, they found themselves on a boat to South America with a young baby and not a word of Spanish between them. <laughs> they lived in Chile for 17 years until 1976, during which time my aunties Debbie, Becky and Tasha were born. We, as, as grandchildren, were blessed with tales of their adventures. And we have grown to appreciate, many of us now parents ourselves, the huge courage and commitment that it must have taken to undercome just the everyday challenges that my grandparents faced, especially in the early years of Chile. In time, Grandpa was made Bishop of Chile, Bolivia and Peru, and he has been credited for establishing a culture of church planting, worship that was true to the Chilean spirit, and church life in South America. In 1977, Grandpa became vicar here at St Andrews, which he embraced with exceptional vision to become a remarkable and inspirational leader to many other church leaders in the UK and worldwide. Grandpa led St Andrews to become a teaching base for ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit. This led to the founding of the New Wine Festival in 1989, followed by Soul Survivor in 1993. Now these festivals were a highlight of the year for myself, my brothers and my cousins from a young age. A fantastic opportunity for us to run free in the safe environment of Shepton, Shepton Mallet Showground, proud of our self-proclaimed celebrity status <laughs> as the grandchildren of David Pitches. <laughs> in 2021, Grandpa was awarded a Lambeth Award for evangelism and witness through the founding of New Wine and Soul Survivor. In a personal tribute to Grandpa, when he passed away, the Archbishop of Canterbury said, David's faith and vision, willingness to appoint superb colleagues, and love for Jesus Christ has had a huge and lasting effect on the churches of this land and all over the world. He truly was a gift, a gift to the church. Even as we grieve his passing, we praise God for his life. Grandpa retired from St Andrews in 1996, but he carried on running New Wine for some years after, and his devotion to his work continued through the writing of numerous books. Grandpa has been an inspirational leader and father figure to so many people worldwide. I speak particularly from his family, that he set the ultimate example. As a devoted husband to Nanan, a fantastic father to his four daughters and grandfather to his 12 grandchildren. Grandpa was also great-grandfather to 19 of the next generation who will remember his witty and loving spirit. 
He always made sure he told us all how proud he was of us all. We will all treasure the encouragement that my grandfather gave us. We will remember his humility, his faith to take risks, his impeccable dress sense, <laughs> his storytelling, even though we often heard the same one several times, <laughs> and of course, his humour. The last time I visited my grandparents, I was filled with the sense that here was a man who was totally content. He knew well that his life on earth was coming to a close, but there was not the slightest hint that this fazed him. He had been drifting in and out of sleep, but still seemed to be loosely following my conversation with Nanan, chirping in with his jolly remarks. And then the phone rang. Grandpa had the phone next to him, so he beat my grandmother to answering it, much to Nanan's frustration. And of course, he seized the opportunity to have some fun. Hello, yes, this is the voice of the now somewhat senile David Pitches. <laughs> it was one of the nurses returning Nanan's call about something to do with Grandpa's care. And I sat back and I watched this sketch, hearing the practitioner on the other end trying their best to uphold some sort of formality whilst Grandpa toyed with them. All the while, Nanan frank frantically gestured for Grandpa to pass the phone. <laughs> Grandpa savoured these few seconds of conversation before saying, perhaps it would be best to relay this to my wonderful, wonderfully patient wife, who is taking such good care of me. Lovely to speak with you, and God bless. Of course, when Nanan took the phone, she noted down the details with the efficiency of an aspiring medic. During which time, Grandpa reiterated to me how blessed he was to have such a devoted wife who took such good care of him. Grandpa lived his final days with his wife and daughters caring for him at his bedside, knowing their love. Personally, I will be forever grateful and proud to have had David Pitches for my grandfather. Now we're going to hear one of two readings that David chose many years ago, in a way his last words to us. Um, the first will actually be on the screen. We go one generation down. Um, Ruby Coxworth will be um, reading uh, the Word of God to us. A reading from 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile we groan, longing to be clothed, instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be enclosed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who is giving us a spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and we prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord, so we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due for us, um, the things that are done in the body, whether good or bad. Well done, Ruby. <laughs> well done. Well done. Uh, Admiral uh, Alan, Alan, you're going to read our second reading. Thank you. Okay, this is a reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning at verse 13. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you, that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, 
will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Alan. Those readings have given us 10,000 reasons and more uh, to bless the Lord. Um, just as the band's getting ready, um, um, rather fitting this song is co-written by Matt Red Med Redmond. Matt, are you here today? I know, that, uh, I know that, that, that was a possibility, Matt. No, I think he's now back in the States, um, probably online. Uh, I remember uh, Matt standing here um, uh, as a very young lad. I don't think he could really play the guitar uh, then, um, but David saw in him a gift and uh, blessed that gift and released it as he did with so many of us. Thank you. Shall we stand together?
Several years ago, um, David said that he would like John to uh, preach John Coles uh, w without telling John. Um, John, would you come? Um, uh, let me pray. Father, we thank you for this dear servant of the Lord who, whom David loves so much. And we thank you for their friendship, their relationship in ministry as well, and for all that you have done through them both. We pray now for your anointing to remain upon our brother John as he brings to us your holy and life-giving word. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chris. Um, maybe it was a good thing I didn't have 13 years to prepare this. We'll see uh, when I've finished whether you agree with that. What a privilege it is to be here together today to celebrate David's life and to thank God for it. And uh, Mary, if I may first say to you and your whole extended family, thank you so much for sharing David with us and uh, inviting us to be with you on this occasion to thank God for him. All of us are here because in one way or another, our lives were changed by knowing David. Um, but none of us carry the extensive memories that you as family carry or now bear the grief that you bear at this particular time. But we are praying for you that as you walk through this particular valley of the shadow of death, you'll know the promised, comforting presence of the Lord Jesus himself. Uh, we can't, of course, remember David without remembering, in part at least, and only some, of his jokes. In the aforementioned book, an American bishop once addressed the subject of preaching with his clergy and gave them a hint, if you don't strike oil in ten minutes, stop boring. <laughs> I'll try. David was simply the best bishop that I ever had. Even though he had no formal ecclesiastical authority over me, he was everything a bishop should be, a true pastor, while at the same time being a pioneering modern-day apostolic leader. On the phone, with a slightly altered voice, he initially rang me up saying, the bishop here sending me into wild panic that it was my authoritative bishop over me and he'd at last found out something that I was doing wrong and breaking the rules. And then with a chuckle, David would say, find out how I was doing, how my wife was, how the children were, how the church was going. He generously gave me and my wife Anne opportunity for ministry for us to grow and to develop which he did for everybody he knew, I believe. He answered our questions with patience and with wisdom. He prophesied over us and prayed for us. And together with Mary, he hosted us, chewed the cud with us, modeled how to lead and love a church well, and how to delight in their children and support them in becoming all that God had made them to be. And... Uh, you also modeled Mary with him, a way of serving the Lord together as husband and wife, using your different gifts in complementary ways. Many of us present here today, or online, experienced that same fathering in God that we all need. While David knew some of those he influenced, his reach was way beyond his relationships. Only last Thursday at an event in London, I talked with a retired leader of the Chinese church. As a missionary in Borneo, he'd found the rigid Pentecostal teaching on being filled with the Spirit and praying in tongues too exclusive. He longed for something more inclusive and empowering for everyone. David's best-selling book, Come Holy Spirit, became a door-opener for him. 
and he subsequently used it, he told me, as his go-to training manual in London, as, uh, as well as there in Borneo. His summary? David changed the church. Not just the Church of England. He had an international and transdenominational impact. But David was loath to blow his own trumpet. He lived with a twinkle in his eye and taught and wrote with a self-deprecating tone. I'm reminded of something that Nicky Gumbel wrote recently in his Bible in a Year notes, which I think describes David well. The ability to laugh at yourself is key to holiness. Take Jesus seriously, but don't take yourself too seriously. A sense of humor is the link between holiness and humility. That's David. He was also a real Bible man, so let's just focus on a couple of phrases from the Bible passage, if we may. First, we do not want you to be uninformed, Paul writes to the Thessalonians. David lived his life that others might be fully informed about the wonder of being loved by God and saved through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he went with Mary to South America, even being willing to learn Spanish and ride a horse named Bomber Atomica. <laughs> That's why he invited the Californian preacher, John Wimber, to teach about ministering in the power and the gifts of the Spirit, first here in St. Andrews and subsequently at national conferences throughout the 80s and 90s. That's why he rejoiced in this launch of Soul Survivor, uh, to reach and teach unreached teenagers and young people. That's why he would engage in friendly conversation with the table waiter at Toby's Carvery in the hope of sharing the gospel with them. And that's why he encouraged and helped young worship leaders like Mike, Matt Redmond to write songs with lyrics conveying a deeper understanding of the power and the efficacy of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he wrote all those books and helped uh, about the gifts of the Spirit, prophecy, church leadership, church planting, liturgy, the Beatitudes, and prayer. Then that's why those books are packed full of quotations and examples from other people's experience from which he had learned as he exercised his love of Christian literature and biographies. On his first visit to St. Andrews here, John Wimber, who became David's great friend, said to him, make sure that whatever God blesses you with, you pass it on to others. I think that's how David lived. Informing others of whatever God had taught and shown him. We do not want you to be uninformed. The ignorance that Paul addresses in the passages that we read is about what happens when we die. To the Corinthians, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. To the Thessalonians, Jesus died and rose. Jesus will return and we will be with the Lord forever. David became aware at a very early age that Jesus Christ was his Savior and Lord and he knew that Trying to live a good life and hoping it was good enough to gain entry to heaven was not sufficient. For we all fall short of the glory of God. The only way of gaining entry is faith in Jesus. And David's infectious and joyful faith was because he knew, using Paul's words in the reading... God has given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. And his security in that was evident throughout his life and his ministry and even in his last days. The penultimate quotation in his biography is from the evangelist D.L. Moody who wrote this. Someday you will read in the paper that Moody is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. That which is born of the flesh may die, but that which is born of the Spirit shall live forever. And David comments, I could not express my own belief 
more clearly than that. He recently told me that in these last years here in Chorley Wood, he's been asking his friends and peers, are you ready? And I ask it of you all and online today, are you ready? How do you get ready? By putting your faith and trust in Jesus as your Savior and Lord, just as David did. And since none of us know when we will live our last day, there is no better day than today to get ready. And you can have that same guarantee and assurance that David had of what comes after our death. There are many here who would pray with you that you would have that guarantee from the Spirit himself if you were to ask for them to pray with you today. Second phrase, which I'll introduce with a question. What are we living for? More particularly, what is your goal in life? St. Paul writes, we make it our goal to please God. Friends, it's so easy to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Please, let's do all we can to avoid that. But what really pleases God? Jesus gives us a clue to a major part of it, to jo- intimate, joyful relationship with him and his Father in heaven. In these words, you are my friends if you do what I ask you to do. So when David felt God encourage, invite, or tell him to do something, he did it. Even if at times it would prove difficult, costly, or controversial. Of which he never seemed to be afraid of being. You need to go to South America as a missionary. So he did. Uh, Please give me space in your busy church services. So he did. Giving time to wait for God to give the gifts of the Spirit needed for that particular occasion. If you want to equip everyone, you need to start a summer holiday conference for everyone. (laughs) So he did. New wine was born and tens of thousands of people's lives were changed forever. It's time to plant new churches in England. So he did. Even knowing would cross parish boundaries and thereby tread on the toes of other church leaders. And when the Episcopal Church in the United States of America was in disarray, David felt the Lord invite him to be involved in consecrating a new missionary bishop who would uphold the traditional teaching on human sexuality and marriage. And so he did. He was a pioneer, not only living at the edge, but sometimes over the edge, beyond it. (laughs) But here's the thing. He wanted to please God by doing whatever God asked him to do. I'm concluding. If you haven't put your faith in Jesus, please do. Please don't be uninformed and unready. Get ready even today. If you're already a believer in Jesus, please make it your supreme goal to please God first and foremost. D.L. Moody gets another mention near the beginning of David's biography. Moody once heard a preacher say, the world has yet to see what God can do through one man totally committed to doing his will. Moody's response was, Lord, let me be that man. And in his biography, David writes his response. Yes, Lord, and me too. Thank you, David, for being a man like that. In a minute, we're going to pray together. Uh, Our prayers are going to be led by, I'm not quite sure, I can't... Sorry? Zach. Zach, okay. Can can we be quiet? Having said that David felt the Lord say, give me space. In all the words of today, let's in silence give God himself space. (laughs) 
And fill this space in silence, Lord, by speaking into our very spirits the word that you want each of us to hear from you today. And then give us grace to do whatever you tell us to do. Thank you, O Holy Spirit, for pouring the Father's love into our hearts and for guaranteeing the hope that lies before us. Amen. Thank you, John. Thank you. Um, we're going to continue in prayer now uh, with Zach's help. Thank you, Zach. Another grandson. The Apostle Paul gave a message to the people of Pisidian Antioch, which is recorded in Acts chapter 13. Verse 36 refers to David, king of Israel, 3,000 years ago. Paul said this, When David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. What a huge and rich amount lay behind that summary sentence of King David's life and work. And I think it is appropriate to use that sentence today as we remember our David. Whether we are a friend or a relative, as we remember David, we recognize that he was an extraordinary man who did indeed serve the purpose of God in his own generation. Let us pray. God of mercy, Lord of life, you have made us in your image to reflect your truth and light. We give you thanks for David, for the grace and mercy he received from you, for the grace and mercy he extended to others, for all that was good in his life, for the memories we treasure today, Especially, we thank you for who he was to each of us. As husband to Mary, as father to Charlotte, Debbie, Becky and Tasha. As a brother, a father-in-law, an uncle, a grandpa, a great-grandpa. As a friend. Lord, we thank you for the person he was, for his warmth his encouragement, his humor, his generosity, his love and kindness, and for the example he was of a life devoted to his Lord and Savior, we will be forever grateful. As today we say goodbye to this dearly loved man, we pray for those who mourn. The Apostle Paul described you as the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. We pray that all who grieve today will know your compassion and your comfort. We thank you that David is with you, that you are his refuge, and through Jesus he rests now in your everlasting arms. As we reflect on the certainty which David had about his eternal security in you, we pray that you would draw each of us closer to you. 
Can I invite you to join me in saying the Lord's Prayer? As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Zach. And thank you for leading us beautifully into the Lord's Prayer, which became for David, well, it was as if his life over those last few years, focused down onto that one prayer. We're going to stand in a moment to give God glory, because that's what David would want us to do, to give God the glory. Um, I just wonder whether I might read to you um, some words that he thought would be his last words, written on November the 17th, 1974. He was in a rickety old aeroplane, tiny little thing, I think, um, heading to Concepcion in the south of Chile. And he writes to Dearest Mary on a, like a sort of serviette thing, wasn't it? Um, I'm writing this as our plane is making a crash landing. <laughs> if we don't make it, I want you to know that all is committed to him. All is committed to God, to the Lord. I love you dearly. And my love to all the children, Charlotte, Debbie, Becky, and Tasha, that they all trust in him, in life and in death. Let me be that sort of person who faces death, but also life in that way. Let us all be that sort of person. Tim, after we sing to the Lord again, um, I, we're hoping you'll give us a blessing. Um, uh, I love uh, it when David uh, blessed people here and uh, new wine in the name of the Lord. And uh, to have you here as vicar, in his footsteps, blessing us in the name of God will, will be good for all our souls. Thank you. Let's give God glory. Thank you. Should we stand together? Do that. 
Before we have our final blessing, just a a few announcements to make about what's happening next. Um, After the final blessing, the family will leave and and, uh, congregate in the foyer. But if everyone else could stay where they are, because we need to transform this place into, um, into a feast of catering. There's going to be a station of food over here by the the drums. There's going to be a station of food in the foyer, and there's going to be a station of food in the lounge. And uh, if you are uh, seated in the upper hall or the lounge, we're going to need to stack your chairs to the side, so please do uh, follow the instructions there. And uh, if you could make your way through to the foyer, those who are seated in the lounge and the upper hall, that would be fantastic. Some of you need to go and not stay for food, and in a few moments, then please do, if that's you, please do make your way and say goodbye to the family who are in the foyer. So for our final blessing. May the dying Saviour's love and the risen Saviour's power and the ascended Saviour's prayer and the returning Saviour's glory be the comfort and joy of our hearts. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his dear Son, Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and your loved ones, both now and now and forever. Amen.